Welcome to Carolina Sculpture Studio. My name is Clint Button and I'm a granite sculptor. Welcome to video number 109 of the Virtual Stone Carving Apprenticeship. I mentioned this before, still working on this side, hadn't quite got it done yet. But uh, over the course of the weekend, I've been away from the stone for a day or two. And I've mentioned this before, when you come in and get started, after you've taken a break, after you've gotten away from it, whatever you've done, it's pragmatic. You may not need to, but you don't dive right into hard things, like edges that are important, or what's more important than this edge, because that's going away, is this panel right here. So I came in, and to warm up, I still had this pad that I hadn't resolved yet. Up the show. You can see there's a step right there, and this one needs to be resolved. I went ahead and cut a new strip up here where really in that critical. I had to cut my edge, and edges don't bother me, and this is waste anyways, and then this is just roughing in. Did this just to warm up because I've been away from it for a period of time and I've focused on something else. So you come back to your stone. It's smart not to jump into this because this is really serious, important. I can't screw this up. This right here is all money. And so I got a good fit over here on this side, over past it. It's just a little bit high. It's all based upon that. It's nice and square, really good shape. This right here, I still got to go in. Oh, no, nah, three eighths, not quite half an inch. To get this straightened up. And over here, it's even closer. You know, it's under a quarter inch over here. So I warmed up first doing this. Now I'm going to work on cleaning this up. Then I'll keep going and, and hopefully wrap this up so we can get on to the next one. Um, but it's it's really important to to plan what you're doing and schedule it and give yourself some warm up time because, like I said, if you start thinking you're the hero, it's when you get spanked. All right, back to work. As I'm moving along, I went ahead with this top, stripped all the way down to the plinth, and I'm wrapping up this portion here. I wanted to try to show you, this is my low spot, okay, on my side where I, where I dipped in. I still stayed up. I was trying careful not to get too low, but I still got low. This is why I talk about how fast things can go wrong when you work fast. You can see right here, this is nearly an inch deep. Over here, I've only got to go half that depth. And I also had to be careful. It's a little hard to see, but the top here, the stone I cut off was actually taller than this. It, it tipped in like that. So you got to go by, like I keep saying, trust your pattern, okay? Go by the pattern, make sure the pattern fits. And, and when you come to a, a transition, a place that is obvious that it changes, you know, you, you got to really lean on your pattern to make sure you get a good fit. Um, in general, you should check all the time as well. But if you're, if it seems like you're pretty high and you're consistently high, like all down through here, you know, I had to take a go about an inch deep all the way down here, but over here, I don't have to go very far. And, uh, so we're still in good shape. This whole side is, I don't know, about an eighth tall for the most part. And we'll, we, but we've got a very, a, a pretty true surface. It's pretty flat. There's no rock. It, it all fits pretty well. And we'll clean that up. We cut from the back because when we cut from the back, the easy way to do it, when we stand this up and we look at this in the light, or I can put a raking light on it now, and we're going to see sort of a corduroy, you know, we're going to see a bunch of stripes through here, but this is all tall. When we stand it up, we'll have our light cascading vertically down here, the way it's going to do in the cemetery. And so when we produce it from the back, we'll put that in, and then we can ax all this with the light oriented the way it's going to be in the cemetery. And it'll, it'll, that'll be the easy way to cut this edge. But we'll have all this done because we're going to cut down into, oh, about here is where the, the actual edge of that 8-inch die is going to be. 
So see if we can get this wrapped up and be done with this side. While we were talking about tools the other day, I thought I ought to throw a couple more in on the shelf. Things I remember that I just never use. And I'll, at this point, you'll probably understand why. Regular nine points, okay. And we've been axing this stone, you know, with bush chisels and big scrapers. Okay, that's what we've been using. They make tools to try to, and when you act something, at the end, you know, you go one way, you go another way, you go diagonal, and you go diagonal, as to how you want the stone to demonstrate in the light. If you want the light to be muted, or if you want to capture it, or if you want to direct it, okay? Action. There's a lot of people out there that didn't know how to act stone properly. So they came up with some innovative ways to surface, to either mimic stuff or to, to mark it up. So if you had a, a rough surface or a wire sawed surface, you could pretend you axed it, okay? This is a star chisel, okay? It's gonna bounce around the same way to peck it up like it's been axed, okay? Take a look at this. We'll do it up here on some nine-pointed stone and do it right here on some sod stone, just so you can see the difference. like a nine point but it's not axed either and this really isn't something that's going to hog off a lot of stone but they sell them i never use it i've had this this one tool i bet for 20 years and I, that's the first time i put it in my machine probably in almost 20 years the other tool they sell is a cup chisel it's got a round piece of carbide on it now this is another surfacing tool that creates a unique character, I never use it. Um, in fact, the ones I've got, I went to, uh, well, Willie Simmons gave them to me down in, at, in Alberton. And uh, we were talking tools, I was in his shed one day, and he says, you run a hand machine? You ever use cup chisels? And I said, no, and he's got one out. He says, here, and he gave me about 20 of them. He says, we've had these things for decades, we never used them. stone up a little better than a nine point um, but that surface is pretty equivalent to what a 16 point does and it leaves little can leave little marks on it try to make the surface look like it's been axed to a certain extent so those are two tools that you can buy I never use them um, maybe they'll fit what you're doing but they've never fit anything I've cut and I've cut a lot of different stuff so just thought while we're out there, before we all go out and spend a bunch of money to buy these and think it's going to be the new magic button that's going to fix things, I never found they were. Okay, back to cut.
That side's done. See if I can turn it just a little bit. There we go. Okay. Now we're pretty much wrapped up with this part of it. Um, I'm not going to cut the plinth right now, um, in part because of what I mentioned. Um, it'd be real easy to go ahead and cut this to dimension right now while it's, I'm sitting here and doing it and all that other stuff. Um, it, to me, it's, it's not worth the risk to have this nice edge, perfectly square finish sitting there for me to take off literally probably a ton of stone and have all that time, I'd rather drop something on there. And then while it's laying down, once I get most of her put together and the big stuff is, is resolved, I'm not taking off large chunks of stone because there's gonna be areas in here where I should be able to shoot a couple of points. And then I can take it either saw or block and, and take out a really big chunk of stone. There's no reason to have that happening above a finished portion and I don't need it finished right now. So we'll do that later. But this is all um, between an eighth and a sixteenth high. This whole this whole edge, and uh, I'm sure. Let's see if we can see it. We've got some corduroy in it. Yeah, you can see. There's a few. Can you see some of the lines, the up and down lines through there, and all that's got to come off. But, We've got to stand the stone up and ax it. We got a lot to take off, and so this is in good shape. But to finish it right now is, I think, the wrong thing to do. So I'm not going to do it. So, uh, but that's that's putting it together. Well, let's let's step back. I want to sort of do some thinking here with y'all. And I want you to see exactly where I'm at and what I've been doing. Uh, in terms of what I've been doing for work just lately, working on this bottom edge, cutting the upper portion, sitting on my bench was a good fit. But reaching below to cut the lower portion that actually had to be nice and clean, it was too short. So I got my crate out. Remember my crate? Hang up from way back in the beginning. It's got three different dimensions. It's got a pad. I think that came from my grandmother. And then this box has got. Set this, up out of the way. this is just a box that has one dimension, two dimensions, and three dimensions so you can adjust it really quickly or you can carry tools in it um, and I've been sitting on it so that I could work on that bottom and have the best posture the best reach I also wanted to show the benefits of the cribbing because this cribbing has you know it's 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 open enough on the sides to where I can sit on my box oh. Box over. I can sit like this, and there's room that I can put my feet underneath the stone. Now, if you put your feet underneath a stone that's on something flimsy, <laughs> uh, the stone will win. But um, this is secure; it's not going anywhere it's with this this crisscross cribbing, and uh, it gives me room to put my feet underneath and actually my legs underneath, so I can work and and function. While this has been underway, I just took the plaster model and I slid her over here. Now, she's been lower. This is lower than what she was sitting before. It's, and uh, she's also been sitting in very different lights. She's been sitting near the front of the studio because we're right here. You know, this is, this is outside. This is the door. And so she's been in a different attitude for me to be able to look at her and see that you know it looks like this one eye isn't quite as even as the other one her 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 left eye the eye over on on this side that eye there 
all these things that you can do to study, you need to know this model really, 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 really well. Um, that's one reason why I've saved the clay. I still have the clay here. And what I'd like to do, I'll bring a really soft brush and I'll brush off some of the dust. Um, what I'd really like to do is to keep this clay here in the studio for reference so that I can have this in the plaster to look at while I'm carving. Um, one of the biggest benefits I think that you'll get from modeling a piece and then casting a piece before you carve it into stone, the benefit for me is that I get to see the piece in this color and this is very flat. I mean, even with, with or without, you know, with the, with the dust on it, it flattens it even more. And it handles light differently. Then we turn around and cast it in, in white plaster. And whether we gesso it or not, she looks a lot different. And you will see highlights and shadows that aren't apparent. Surface issues that you won't notice on the clay, you'll see on her. And this helps you evaluate the overall project because you will be able to see that something looks good or doesn't look good. You have two different options to look at this or to look at the clay in the back of the studio so that when you actually start carving it, if you want to amend this and fix it a little bit, like if you want a little bit more volume somewheres, you know, you can mark it on here, draw it with a pencil. If you want a little less volume, you can do the same thing. And then when you carve it, because we're in control. Okay, the, the enlargement process, we're not going to be crazy anal about enlarging every single detail on this and taking a point every few inches. We're going to take points at, at areas of transition, and then we're going to directly carve between those to make it work. Um, that's, that's pointing with compasses. That's typical. Uh, when we point with a pointing machine, we're going for generally more accuracy because we're doing a one-to-one -one reproduction. So this is going to guide us. And the more we study this model, this three-dimensional form, the more we study it, the better we're going to understand it. We've had plenty of time to study it. And I got to put away a couple of stands and, uh, do some rearranging. I don't, I don't know that I'm going to be able to put her up here and be able to reach her like I'd, I'd like to. Um, but I got to see where I can set the clay because if I stand that vertical, she's going to tend to fall apart in this, this heat uh, because we're fixing to get into, you know, 100 degree plus weather over the next, next uh, couple of months, three months, whatever, here in South Carolina. But uh, I'm going to pick up a little bit more, and, and we'll be back here. Let's see what we can put away that doesn't need to be out. Study your models. Study them hard. And then we're going to, once we get this going, we've got to, we'll pick this up. I've got to lay out. Um, I've got to lay out my points for my foundation points and whatever center line I want to use and coordinate that between where the center line is on this so that I've got the center line all worked out. And once we've got that together and the center line, the, the points I'm pointing from can be, you know, over here, whatever, they don't have to be just in this area, but we'll set this up. And, uh, we've got to figure if this is scaled at six inches, you know, this is four inches on the model. It'll be six inches when we enlarge it by 30% by a third. We're going to have to put a center line on here. If we lower this to five inches, we've got to remember the top of that job is scale is, is scaled out to be five foot six from wherever this line is. If it's here or if we move it down an inch, we don't just go up five, six from here to our six foot tall die to the other end. We have to figure that from down here and uh, that will change um, the reference on this but we can still keep our top we can still make the die that much taller we're just going to have to extend these two corners right here 
a little bit. Or we'll have to cut in further down there. But that's why these are separate. We can put a line across here. I'm going to try to, I want to see what I can do there to put that in to have the right, right uh, fixture. And uh, that's some of the stuff we'll get together and then we'll check back in. And every once in a while, well, housekeeping is housekeeping. You know, there's always stuff to do. And so, when your pipe fit is getting buggered up enough, you know, I mean, I don't have to do this very often. You take them apart, you know, this is a, off the suction. Take it apart, clean it, put new tape on it, because this was torn all the way around the edge here where, you know, this protruding edge was, was all wrecked. So, it kind of wrecks how the suction works. You have some part squasher cleaner, get your little aerosol thing to, you know, fill it up and pressurize it, and it's it's a spray bottle that lasts forever. So while you're using those chemicals that kill the environment, you can not make any trash. But this stuff isn't rocket science to do. You just have to put them together. And, uh, but they work a lot better if you clean them, you know, and you can just throw them away and get new ones, but I don't know, I like my old stuff. You'll put a few pieces on like this. Make them good and long. Get it where it needs to be. Then after you tape it up a few times, you can just go round and round and round. But you can always buy good duct tape. Don't buy the cheap stuff, especially if you're doing something long term like this where you want it to last for years. Because even this good 3M tape, you know, it's pretty strained here in this hot environment. But see if you tape a corner over a few times. And then we'll just keep going and I'll wrap the whole thing around and then we'll just wrap it and wrap it and make it right. Y'all can figure that out, can't you? <laughs> there, now it's all pretty again. Let's stick it back on. All right, I did a little bit of rearranging and picking up. I decided to leave this other art easel, this other modeling stand here, uh, just to use it to set calipers on while I'm working. Um, I want to, I got to, still got to make a cover for that at some point, so it's not just a, a table, but, uh, and so it doesn't get bumped and chipped, um, but having this stand here, it's within just, you know, I can take just right here and reach and set my caliper down. Um, I'm going to start setting her up, the initial stuff with her up here on the stone. I don't know that it's going to work long term, but I've got a point to her midsection. And so I've got all of that material to, to come off, all of this. And that's all gonna be like from right here to the side of the stone. It's not gonna be that much. So I can slide her over enough that I can reach her um, and, and access everything. And uh, I'm, I'm also thinking, gotta go down to five inches here. And I really don't wanna make the her shorter on the die any shorter than she needs to be and i don't want to make the die a lot short I'd, I'd rather have the wing tips pop up a little bit so i'm going to do some thinking um one of the things that because we're in charge and we're doing it you rarely have you're more apt to have fault when you do a, a figurative work like this with having one the head too big and two, having her too short. Um, it's real easy to make something that looks good, and then it's it's just a little bit short, and it just looks, looks makes her look just stumpy enough, short enough that the elegance is lost. So, something else that I can do is instead of putting my foundation points 
along the top of this plinth, I could put them the equivalent of one inch down and put them down here and shoot her from there. And that means I could take then and shoot her and everything, she would be shifted up. And so her feet would be an inch high, but it's pretty easy to stretch it just by direct carving in this area, you know, go up to around her knee and all of this that drops, I can just stretch all this a little bit, even if I have to carve most of it direct because I can cut down to say here and then cheat this line to there and make it work. And this is, this is one of the things with, with doing um, uh, a genre on icon oriented drapery is that this drapery makes sense to people. And after you carve this drapery as many times as I have, it's pretty easy to put it together in whatever scale because 90% of the jobs that I've carved with this drapery, I haven't pointed. You just look at them and carve them. And so you learn how deep you've got to go. And for instance, if I go this deep here and it's an inch high, it's not going to hurt me to shift this down and carve it a little bit longer. I can get this depth figured out and then on the job it's just going to end up being a little bit longer and I can bring your feet down to the bottom I've carved a lot of toes so um, I'm going to think about that that may be what we do and then I'll just put my line in here where I'm the equivalent of one inch down so that I would be where five inches is from the bottom of this or one inch down from the top on this six I'd be five inches up from the joint put my two foundation points and then just shoot her and I'll I'll point everything pretty much until it starts to drop. And then this area in here is gonna pull forward, is gonna come down an inch. So I can't go full depth there, but wherever this stuff is, this will all sink. And so that can all be, I can shoot those points and then just migrate everything down and carve that direct. Cause there's gonna be a lot of detail that's direct. And the last detail people are really gonna pay attention to is, is this drop they're going to look at this long as long as it's a nice long sweep it's really good so we could move this knee down on the job you know maybe half an inch three quarters of an inch just to pull these two folds down a little bit further and uh to bring it down just a little bit and then make up the difference here and she'll only be an inch taller because she's five six now that'd make her five seven and it's real easy to cheat that much so that's what you can do when you when you know how to do this and you know what you're doing so I'm gonna, we'll do some layout and figure it out. But this ought to wrap this video up. I'm sure it's long enough. My name's Clint Button. I'm a granite sculptor here at Carolina Sculpture Studio with a virtual stone carving apprenticeship. Thanks for coming in.